Okay, so let's start. So what you've learned so far is uh, about pins. Sometimes this is important in networks. And what we saw is that for some PDs, pins can be great, especially when there is uh, low amounts of training data or no data even, right? So in principle, pins can solve a PDE just from the inputs, that is initial conditions, boundary conditions, and so on. Whereas there are many negatives, right? Then uh, trainability is a negative. Uh, trainability. What else did you see? Spectral bias. What not? There are many, many negatives. Expressivity. So pins are not a solution for everything. In fact, uh, if you take practical problems, uh, there's a good chance that these things won't work. So in some sense, we need alternatives. And especially these alternatives, they might come into their own when we have more data. And I'm going to tell you in a minute what more data means, right? So that's why we are going to change perspective. So in the beginning of the course, our perspective was that given a PDE, given the initial boundary conditions, how can we tailor neural networks in order to solve this PDE, right? But now we are saying something different. So given a PDE, and given some data about the PDE, in some cases, you need not even know what the PDE is, but just given some data about the PDE, can you learn the solution, right? And as I said, I'm going to sort of explain what the target is. And this is a little bit like traditional machine learning. When you do dogs and cats machine learning, what do we do? We take lots and lots of images of dogs, lots and lots of images of cats. And in each case, we say, this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a cat. And at test time, we have some other image of a cat and ask it to classify whether it's a dog or a cat, right? That's, that's what it does. So one can think of it as uh, what is called supervised machine learning because it's supervised by the data or in terms of the data. So this is going to be the, uh, this is going to be sort of the main, main goal of the next several lectures that we have some data. We'll see how much data, but how are you going to leverage that data in order to solve things? So let's get right into it. And please feel free to ask questions either here in class or those who are joining on Zoom. And I'm happy to take them. Okay, so first let me revisit what does it mean to solve a PD, right? And this is uh, best to give some examples because this is going to be very, very important. So the most elementary example of a PDE, or one of the elementary examples of a PDE, is this uh, equation here. Now this is uh, sort of a prototypical, let's write it like this. It's a prototypical elliptic PDE. There's a proper definition that you can give of ellipticity and so on, but I'm not going to do that. So what does it model? What does it uh, represent? So now if you look at the PDE, so this is a gradient, this is the divergence. So if you remember divergence of any function is simply the, the trace of the second derivative. So trace of the, no, what am I talking about? That should be the Laplacian. So the divergence is, oh, sorry, let me undo it. So the divergence, divergence of any vector field is given by summation over i of dxi of ui, something like this, right? So this is going to be the divergence of the vector field. And what are these quantities? So the quantity of interest that we have u, so this is, for instance, depending on what application you're looking for, it's the temperature or the pressure, okay? F is some sort of a source term, so it's right here. And then you have, uh, let's use something else. Then you have A. A is the conductance uh, or the permeability of a medium. So what does it mean? So let's say that we are in, in the medium. The medium here is given by just a unit square. So right here. And you have some material properties. For instance, as I said, it's permeability, which means that uh, let's imagine that we are under the ground, under the earth. And of course, some parts of the rock, it's easier for a fluid to flow. Some parts of the rock, it's less easy for a fluid to flow. And then you put in some source. Let's say that you inject uh, water from some source here. And then you want to see in this medium how this water is diffused out or it flows. So this is what is called a RC type flow. And this is how the pressure of the fluid is going to be. Or if you want to think in terms of uh, an electrical impedance problem, so what you do is you have a material. So again, on the unit square, 
and the conductivity of the material or the inverse of the resistivity of the material is given by the given by the picture here and then you put in some voltage on the on the boundary of the material or you put in some source of voltage and then you observe how the current uh, the changes for instance so this could also be the current or whatever it is modeling so this is a typical example of an elliptic pd so the inputs that we are given in this case okay i wrote it only so i fix s i fix the source s so now this is a good question to some of you here so what is the minimum assumption that I need on my coefficient? So A is nothing but a coefficient. So we can call it as a coefficient. What is the minimum assumption that I need on my coefficient for this problem to be elliptic? Who can tell me that? Because now we are doing PDEs, so you should know what is an elliptic PDE. What assumption do I need on my coefficient so that this problem is elliptic? Yeah, who says that? Can I take any coefficient? No? So what should what condition should I have on my coefficient? I don't, there are many things that I need, but I, what is the bare minimum that I need? Yes. Yeah, positive semi-definite is enough. Or in this case, let's say roughly speaking, positive. Uh, it's, uh, so the, the, you, you can't just have arbitrary problems. So your inputs have to belong to some, let's say, reasonable class of functions. So in this case, so you fix the source. So my objective is given A, find u. It's as simple as that. I could have also varied the source, but let's keep only one thing fixed and the other things varying. So at the end of the day, solving a PDE, which is here, essentially means that I have to find the answer to this question, which is given my coefficient A, conductivity or permeability, I have to find the solution u. So you can imagine that this is a function and this is also a function. Later on in the course, we'll be more precise about what does it mean to be a function. But imagine a function is a continuous object. So in principle, I have given any point here, I should be able to measure these functions. Given any point here, I should be able to measure these functions. So for this PDE, my input is a function uh, A, my output is also a function U. And the mathematical object that describes a mapping just like a function is a mapping which takes a number and maps to a number, or it takes a vector and it maps to a vector, the mathematical object that takes a function and it maps to a function is what we call as an operator. Uh, again, there is, this is fairly standard terminology. So this is what is an operator. So this object here is an operator. So solving a PDE simply means, in some sense, finding the solution operator. Finding the solution operator. The operative word to take here, pun intended, is that uh, you have the input is a function and the output is going to be a function. Okay, so this is uh, what it means to solve an PT. In PINs, you are actually doing that. Uh, just didn't realize it or it was not formulated in this manner, but it is exactly what is happening. So this is one example. Uh, you hurry up a little bit. Here is another example. What does it mean to solve a PD? This is slightly more complicated PD, but it's a very important one. We will revisit it several times today. These are the flows or the PDEs which model fluid flows or compressible fluid flows. These are called the compressible Euler equations. And it's often nice to write down what these equations are. So they are given here. So what are these quantities? So rho here is the density. V is the velocity field. Right, that's the natural uh, notation for velocity. P here is the pressure. I is what is called uh, just an identity. Uh, it's, it's an identity in order to define this. E is the total energy. So there are four uh, or five unknowns, depending on how many dimensions that you're in, but they are related to each other. So the total energy is given in terms of E is equal to. Um, for instance, for an ideal gas, something like this, uh, rho on phi squared. Okay, so this is what you learn in thermodynamics. This is very basic thermodynamics. So these are the compressible Euler equations. These are evolution equations. Why is that? Because you have time. And what is the target? So, and then you have these quantities. They are essentially conservation laws because this is the conservation of mass, of momentum, and of energy. So this is what they represent mathematically. And so you have these equations. And what is the objective? 
the objective now is that you're given initial conditions. So I call my vector. Now the, 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 the solution itself is a vector. It is uh, the mass, the momenta, the, the density, the momentum, and the energy. So this guy here is a, is a vector. And I have been given some initial value, which I'm going to call as A. Okay, for instance, if you look at this picture here, so this is going to be how the initial condition looks like for the, I'm not visualizing every variable here, but this is the density and the velocity field. It's in two dimensions. So you have the density here, uh, the colors, there's a color map. So then these are the colors. And then you have, uh, so these are the colors here. And then you have the arrows, which are pointing out the velocity field, okay? So this is what the initial conditions are. Let us assume some simple boundary conditions. For instance, that the flow is periodic, then what is the objective? The objective is given the initial condition, given A, I'm going to find the solution U at a certain time. So this is at T equal to two, for instance. Or in this case, it is just the density. As you can see, it's a very, very complicated solution, right? It has lots of eddies and uh, uh, fingers which are pointing out and so on, but that doesn't matter. The objective is again, given a function, which is the initial condition here, I want to find the solution at a later time. I could also find the trajectory of the solution. So that would be u dot t and I vary t. So that would be a mapping from a going to the trajectory of the solution. Sometimes it is not enough to find a snapshot. Just imagine predicting the weather. You want the weather tomorrow at 12, day after tomorrow at 12, and the day after tomorrow at 12, the day after that at 12, right? So you need the trajectory and not just the uh, weather tomorrow at 12, but you can see that these two things are related. So what is the object that we need to do? What does solving a PDE mean again? In this case, it is again finding the solution operator, which is here. And this is a mapping now, which takes the initial conditions, which are here, and it gives you the solution at a later time, or it could give you the whole trajectory of the solution. But again, my input is a function, in, in, in principle, it's a function. You'll see that there is a nuance to that and my output is going to be a function. So in both the cases and in all cases involving PDEs, at the end of the day, the object that we have to approximate, the object that we have to find is, okay, let's use find the solution operator. Okay, so now let us try to sort of, so is this clear? So the solution, the PDE, solving a PDE is finding a solution operator, finding a mapping that takes an input function and produces an output function. So this is how, what you should always remember. And this will lead to some issues uh, as you'll see in a second. So let me just uh, set it up a little. So now let's formalize things a little bit at least. So you don't need to know what Banach spaces are. Uh, those who know it, it's good, but if you don't know, it's okay. So Banach spaces are essentially function spaces or the other way around, function spaces are Banach spaces mostly. Okay, but uh, let's, let's keep this set up. So now you have, uh, these are the spaces which take in the inputs and the outputs. And uh, because we are going to do some learning, we have to put a measure because at the end of the day in learning, you have to show some examples, right? So for instance, in this particular problem, this could be different initial conditions. Right, so this could be different uh, distribution of these, um, for instance, these interfaces and so on. So you have to put some sort of a measure on your function space, more about that later. So this is sort of the basic setup that you have these function spaces where your input and output live and you have a PDE. So this could be whatever the elliptic PDE that you saw, or it could be Euler or Navier-Stokes or whatever equations that you have. And essentially the solution operator, the object that I just wrote down. So this is a solution operator. It's a mapping from X to Y. So you can think of X as an input space. And you can think of Y as the output or the target space. The difference from what you have learned so far is earlier these things were all finite dimensional. Now they're infinite dimensional, they're function spaces. So you, you cannot, you cannot hope to learn them or you cannot hope to characterize them just with finitely many parameters. You'll see that in a second. So this is the mapping and I am, so this is my, so I, I take the inputs here and the solution operator simply takes the inputs and it provides the output, okay? So solving a PDE or using learning in this case is that I want to learn this operator from data. 
And uh, the last time I taught you, which was four or five lectures ago, I told you exactly why we need this, right? Because uh, if I would have used a finite uh, traditional numerical method, for instance, a finite uh, volume method uh, to, to solve this problem, given this image, to find this image, how much time does it take to be us now? I don't, uh, <laughs> yeah but still a few seconds, no? And 3D, few hours. No? <laughs> so, so essentially this is still uh, an expensive operation uh, for each, each solve, but uh, with pins, for instance, you will not, not be able to solve this problem by no one has been able to solve this using pins. So essentially, so why do we need to learn operators from data? Because evaluating them each time, particularly in 3D is expensive. So we need to learn operators from data. And this is essentially the core of what is called operator learning. And the next several lectures are going to be devoted to that. Because if you go to a traditional machine learning course, you don't learn this. This is what is relevant for PDEs and ODEs for that matter, any differential equations, any scientific computing application. And I tried to explain to you why. Okay, but what is the twist here? So the rationale is clear, objective is clear, but what is the twist? The twist is, so far, we have been relying on deep neural networks, but you can take Gaussian processes, you can take radial basis functions, whatever is your preferred learning uh, framework. But the problem is that let's, let's fix deep neural networks here. So the point with deep neural networks, let me give you some notation, let's say L star. It's always a mapping from some input space, a D in, to some output space. It could be a manifold, but the point is that D in and D out these are finite quantities. What did I try to do here? So it is strictly less than infinity. These are finite quantities, right? So this could be very large. So D in and D out could be large. We'll see that could be large, but they are finite, okay? So whenever we have finite dimensional quantities, neural networks are mappings between these finite dimensional quantities. But this is precisely the problem here because we no longer have finite dimensional quantities. But remember, in principle, we have functions and we are going to map them to functions, right? So a priori, just at the face of it, it seems like, oh, now we have a problem, right? So because deep neural networks, they only take uh, vectors to vectors, for instance, or tensors to tensors, but now you really have uh, functions to functions. So how are we going to do this, right? So this is why operator learning is an important topic because it's not straightforward, not clear how this is going to be done. But in today's lecture and in the remaining lectures, I will try to sort of solve or try to find out some solution to this particular problem. But before I give you the first solution, is there any question here in the, in the room or in, on, on the Zoom, Zoom room? So did everyone understand what operator learning is? So why we need to learn operators? Is that clear? The rationale is clear? Okay, we'll do a quiz later to find that out, but just joking, but okay. So first solution, let's find a solution, right? So the first solution is cheat, okay? Essentially it is, uh, let me even put it when you can't. So the first solution is essentially cheat but it's good enough, you'll see in a second why. Okay, so the first solution, as I said, uh, and mathematicians are very good at this. So you have an unknown problem. And the only way we do is we map it into a known problem, right? So we somehow cheat our way out of it. And this is what we do. So remember that the setup was uh, what it was, means uh, we, we have this was our setup. So the cheating is the following. It's not really cheating, it's, it's also very important in practice. Okay, so remember that my mapping was uh, from a, sorry, from a function space to a function space. So this is the most general case that you can consider because uh, PDEs are naturally posed in function spaces. However, in practice, in many, many situations, and I'll explain one concrete situation in some detail, what happens is, remember that all the time I said that uh, there is a measure because we are going to draw data from a measure, put it on our machine learning architecture and ask it to infer what is the target, right? Now, what I'm going to do, at least in this lecture, we will we'll see what are the pitfalls of this approach in the next lecture, is I make a huge assumption. The assumption is, 
and it's clear why I made that assumption, is that this measure is supported in finite dimensions. Okay, this is a mathematical statement. I don't have to explain the details here, but essentially remember that uh, whenever I draw a function, let's say A, I draw it from this measure. Somehow, all that I do is that uh, I characterize this in terms of finite dimensions. Finite dimensions. Or A, the input is a function A of Y, okay? It's a function which is characterized by finitely many inputs and y is uh, belonging to some big y, which is inside some finite dimension space. So what I'm saying is in the beginning, we are not going to look at uh, all possible functions, but we are going to look at functions which are characterized by finitely many dimensions. Okay, and there will be a rich class of those functions and I'm going to explain that. So what do I, what do, what do I benefit by that? What I benefit from that is that I reduce my problem, which was essentially an infinite dimensional problem to something which is finite dimensional. That's why it's a cheating approach, right? So what is the consequence of that? You will see it in a second, but the consequence of that is what we get because we have finitely many parameters. So in other words, each of these functions is characterized by finitely many parameters. I just change these finitely many parameters and I get a different function. I change them again and I get a different function. I change them again and I get a different function. So at the end of the day, any function that I would have drawn from this distribution, I, it's enough if I draw from a finite dimensional distribution. So that was sort of the basic, basic logic here. Okay, and this results in what is called a parameterized PDE. Let me try to explain that in some detail. In a, in a problem which is of quite a bit, bit of importance, I think I've already touched upon that in the beginning. So this is a problem of uh, flow past an aircraft in general or any, any body, it could be a rocket, uh, something in general, or it could just be a bluff body like a Frisbee, whatever. But uh, I'll focus on airfoils because airfoils are just cross sections of aircraft wings. And the idea is the following. So look at this picture here. So possibly this is where things can be explained in the best manner. So. So now essentially I have a flow, okay? I have a flow in a domain and the domain itself is defined in terms of, so my domain D is my domain here. The domain is defined in terms of some shape S. So this is a shape S, okay? Now this is a shape. So essentially I could have characterized it by a function because indeed it is a function, but uh, you'll see in a second that I can do better than that or I can do it in an easier manner. And then I have some flow. And then the flow is modeled in this case by the compressible oil equations. So compressible oil are exactly the equations that we saw here, okay? So it's the same equations, compressible oil equations. And uh, so the flow is modeled by that. So there is some boundary conditions here. And then because the flow comes in at a certain speed, there is a certain body, this is a streamline body. If it was a bluff body, it would be what it would be. But because it's a streamline body, these are the sort of, I visualize the flow by using what are called Mach contours, some observables of the flow. And then you can see that the streamlines are, so there are some nice regions here, the smooth regions of the flow here, but there is also what is called a shock wave here and so on. So this is a flow, which is fairly complicated. <clears throat> it doesn't take seconds uh, to compute this. Uh, it takes, uh, I think the courses resolutions take some minutes, but not seconds, because there is some, this can be done by a finite volume method with some unstructured grids. Anyway, so, so this is how the, how the flow is. Now, where does the parameterization come in? Or where is the function space approach coming in? So remember that I told you about the shape here, S, right? Because the domain itself is defined by this uh, shape that I have here. So now, uh, it is the compressible oil equations. So what I do is uh, the shape itself could be characterized by what is called a level, a level set function. Some of you might know this. So which is a function, right? But then we are in this infinite dimensions because my objective is, and you'll see a concrete example either later in today's lecture or in the next lecture, my objective is that I change the shape and I want to compute the flow. 
I change the shape again, I want to compute the flow. Why do I want to do that? Because I want to find an optimal shape so that my aerodynamic properties are nice, the drag is reduced and so on. But more on that later, the point is that uh, the shape itself is given in terms of a function. So it would have been a mapping from a function to a function, which would be the flow. But actually we can do better. That was not me, right? So actually, in, uh, we, we need what is called, so you could have the field, which is uh, the, the solution. It's given as a function of time. In this case, we are only looking at steady flows, so we don't need the time, x and y. Or you could have an observable. An observable in this case is going to be, for instance, many of you might know this, lift and drag. So these are the typical aerodynamic body forces. That These are numbers. At the end of the day, you are interested in these numbers. So it's a mapping from a function, the level set, two numbers, let's say in that way. However, in practice, you have to manufacture this airfoil. So if you look at people in Boeing or Airbus or whoever is making military aircraft, these are the people making civilian aircraft, they, they cannot manufacture functions. You know, They have to send it to a manufacturing unit to manufacture it. What they do is that they characterize all possible shapes by finitely many parameters. Okay, somewhere later, I think I even have the pictures of these parameters, but these parameters are called what are called as Higgs Henne parameters. Okay. And usually the people use anywhere between 50, 20 to 50 of them. So in other words, instead of writing the shape as a function, which it could be, I'm simply characterizing it. These are like splines, essentially. Those who know splines, these are like spline coefficients. They have some complicated form, but that's why I don't write them here. But the idea is that you can characterize the shape even though it is a function, implicitly it is a function, but I can characterize this function by uh, 20 to 50 parameters. So in other words, I have not cheated here because this is what the manufacturer has to do in practice because each of these parameters has a certain interpretation, a certain engineering interpretation. Uh, don't ask, I actually know the interpretation of most of them. But uh, so these shapes or these parameters by varying this 20 to 50 parameters, you can generate different shapes. We'll see different shapes here, but you can generate different shapes. So this is what is called the design envelope because you can't manufacture beyond this uh, envelope. So essentially I've reduced the problem, which would have been an infinite dimensional problem if I had the level sets to a finite dimensional problem with 20 to 50 parameters. And uh, in many, many problems of interest, this, this can be done, okay? And why is this, uh, why can this be done? Let me give you another quick example. Uh, let's use a blank paper and write down very quickly. So the, the reason why this can be done is the following. So essentially what we are saying is I have an operator which takes A and maps to you, okay? But what roughly speaking, uh, perhaps I'll have the time to formalize it later. Roughly speaking, let's say that A belongs to some, let's say for simplicity square integrable functions defined on some domain D, then we know that A can be written in terms of simply some basis functions. Well, K from one to infinity of some C K phi K, phi K is some basis. And this for instance could be Fourier basis, sine and cosine, like trigonometric basis, Fourier basis. And then all that you do is that uh, instead of taking this infinite basis, you can say that I do the following approximation. This is still an approximation, but a reasonable approximation that I will only take A for finitely many bases, K from one to KT, C, K, P, K. So even though I'm still realizing in, uh, functions, but all that I do now is my function is completely characterized in terms of the basis coefficients, K from one to capital KT, okay? So in other words, I have reduced my problem from an infinite dimensional problem to a finite dimensional problem by essentially using this kind of a basis expansion. And roughly that is what is being done here with a much more sophisticated basis with some, uh, some splines. So in practice, in many, many cases, what you do is that you reduce your function to a finite dimensional object. So that's why you can, you can essentially cheat, but you, there, is, there is a price to pay. Uh, you'll see that in the next lecture, okay? Once I have reduced everything to a finite dimensional input and finite dimensional output, for instance, I'm only interested in observable, like the lift and the drag, then it's uh, business as usual, right? Then we are in the setup of supervised learning with deep neural networks. 
Okay, so did you understand this rationale? It's it's cheating, but it's sort of well reasoned cheating because without this cheating, we would really have to deal with an infinite problem. But as I said, the cheating comes with a cost. So now the point is uh, we have we have the so the the target. So earlier, so see how I shifted the target. So earlier, my target was to learn operators from data. So this would have been infinite dimensional objects, and this would this is a hard problem. So I reduced it to a tractable problem simply by saying that now you can approximate uh, fields. This is the solution of the PDE or observables, but with deep neural networks, because then I can use my finite dimensional uh, construction. And then of course, I have the usual, usual story. I need some, some training data. This you already know from the very first lecture. I have these training parameters and I need some, some training data. And usually, and this is an important point, that I choose my training data randomly, okay? And so there are two important points here. So even if I reduce the problem to a finite dimension, if this dimension is still high, it's 20 to 50 is a high dimension, right? We are used to two or three dimensions and three is sometimes too big, but now you really have to, in, in parameter space, you really have to deal with high dimensional problems. So everything is sort of, uh, this is plain vanilla machine learning. The two points, uh, high dimensional inputs and uh, then you have random training data. Training data. What does it mean? It means that I, for instance, in this particular problem, remember that I have this 50 dimensional, let's say 50 now. So I have a 50 dimensional parameter space and I am, I'm going to randomly sample vectors from this 50 dimensions. Each of these 50 dimensional vectors correspond to a certain shape. So, so for instance, to this shape, then I compute the flow through my finite volume method. This takes a few minutes, uh, five minutes is good enough. Uh, on a single machine, five minutes is good enough maybe two minutes you can get away with, but less than that is difficult at the moment. So let's say two minutes on a, on a, on a standalone machine, then you get the flow. And from this, you compute the lift and the drag. And you do that, I don't know, 100 times, 100 times is 200 minutes, starts getting expensive, 1,000 times, 2,000 minutes, starts getting expensive, 10,000 times. But 10,000 is nothing for machine learning, you know? So, <laughs> right, because, uh, but, 10,000 times, that's 20,000 uh, minutes. That's quite expensive, right? So you see that, uh, you see what I'm hinting at. But in principle, this can be done. So we reduce the problem to a plain vanilla machine learning problem where we need supervision. So the target, which is here, is obtained from experiments or measurements in the field or experiments or numerical simulations. How else are we going to obtain that? So this is different uh, in some sense from pins because in pins, the target would have been only initial and boundary data, which is a part of the problem in general. Here on the other hand, you don't necessarily have uh, any particular physics input. You just learn things from data. So now let's take a little break now. Let's uh, meet at 10 past, but uh, in the meanwhile, I will just give you a little preview of what, uh, what I'm going to do is okay. So now this is a, so by cheating, we have reduced our problem to something which is tractable. But even in this setting, are there some caveats? Are there some issues? And you'll see that indeed you have. And this is what we will we'll focus on after the break. Okay, so let's meet here at 10 past. That's 15 minutes from now. Recording. Okay, so we cheated our way of the problem, but still we have not solved it because there are still issues. And let me try to explain that very quickly. Okay, so first thing, so essentially my operator learning was reduced to a problem of supervised learning, but for high dimensional parametric PDEs. So this high dimensions is going to be of critical role, right? So the first question that one asks, so for simplicity, instead of looking at uh, Okay, both fields and observables can be considered, but I just took observables, so things are easy. So the what is the setup? Just to remind you, the setup is the following. So I have uh, L is my ground truth. 
Okay, so this is ground truth, and this is the mapping between some high dimensional input space RT to some other space T RS, for instance. Okay, and uh, L star is my neural network approximation. So the first question that one asks is uh, usually, can we find a deep neural network such that for a desired accuracy, for a desired amount of error, uh, is this true? In other words, can I approximate my ground truth, assuming that I have infinite data and so on? Can I assume? Uh, can I approximate it to sufficient accuracy? And the answer is, of course, yes, because this is something that we touched in the very beginning of the lectures, which is that neural networks, whether they are deep or shallow, they have what is called a universal approximation property. In other words, as long as you're mapping, the mapping that you are looking at, which is a mapping between this high dimension parameter space and whatever output space, target space, as long as this mapping is continuous, all of you know what a continuous function is, but even, even weaker than that, as long as it is even measurable, this is uh, much weaker, then in particular discontinuous functions uh, are included in that. As long as it is in this case, then indeed, yes, there will always be a neural network. Uh, finding it from data and from optimization is a different question. But as long as it is there, this is indeed true. And I think uh, Ben has already also talked about that, right? But one can be even more concrete. For instance, you can use results from Yarovsky, a uh, Russian mathematician, who showed the following, that if my function has some properties, so in particular, if it belongs to this space here, so WSP is nothing, P is just regularity. So just like I say, integrable functions, square integrable functions, uh, cubic integrable functions and so on. So this is just integrability. Integrability, P. S here is what is called as your smoothness. So essentially you have a function, the function is integrable and its derivative is integrable. Then we say it's in W1P, W11. If its second derivative is integrable, then we say it's in W21 and so on. So more amount of smoothness you have, this S becomes larger and larger. Okay, so P you can think of one or two means, but S is what is uh, important here. So one can prove a result like this, which says that given any target, which belongs to this target space with uh, some smoothness, then we can find a neural network uh, this is usually different parameters, ReLU, it could be with hyperbolic tangent, whatever activation function that you choose, roughly speaking, it uh, with M parameters, so M is the total number of weights and biases, or non-zero at least, such that the estimate that one can prove is something like this. So what does it say? Remember, as M increases, my error should go down. So I take, by taking larger and larger networks, I should be able to make the error smaller and smaller. It turns out that yes, this can be done. It depends on two things. It depends on the smoothness S. So other words, smooth maps are easier to learn. Not surprising, right? Because the smoother the map is, the easier it is to approximate it with a linear map perhaps, and then, uh, then you can use that to leverage that. So smoother the map, the easier it is to learn, which is not surprising. But here is the point that is the most problematic. And this is that it depends on this D here, right? And it depends in a negative way on the D. In other words, more dimensions, the worse it is to learn. <clears throat> they can become larger. And this thing is what is called as the curse of dimensionality, okay? In other words, in order to get a certain error, the size of my network has to grow exponentially in dimension exponentially in dimension. And what is dimension now? Dimension is my space that I'm looking at, this parameter space that we were looking at. So let's say 20 dimensions. So I just uh, tried to put these numbers uh, to give you some perspective. <clears throat> okay, more smooth then you can overcome dimensions, but in general, we are not very smooth. For instance, you can imagine that uh, this particular map you even have discontinuities, right? So you have a discontinuity here. So in this case, S is one, not, uh, it's not even in W11, but it's in PV. So it's S is essentially one, but D star, D bar here, the output dimension, I should have called it as D bar. This is much bigger than one. So just for a simple example, let's say that S is one and D bar is six. 
And just to get 1% error, so error will be like 10 to the power minus two, you can just do the math here and you find that the network size that you need is like a trillion. Okay, so this seems idiotic, right? So if this were true, then we could learn nothing because uh, even to learn something simple, a map in six dimensions, which is not very regular, then you need a huge network. So either we look at small dimensions or we have some sort of regularity, some form of regularity. Often the second is the case because otherwise neural networks shouldn't work because they work in billions of dimensions, uh, not billions, but large enough set of dimensions, right? So what is going on here? So this analysis tells us that beware, high dimensional maps could be a problem. But then one understands that <clears throat> The objects that we are going to approximate, these are not some random high dimensional maps. These have a little bit more structure and a little bit more structure enables you to overcome this. So in particular means I think Ben touched on this at some point, but let me very quickly tell it again. So your error, the total error that you're going to make, uh, there is a decomposition that one can make, which is divided into three pieces, essentially. This is very traditional from learning theory. And the first piece, which is this approximation. Approximation says that I have a function, which is, I don't know, it belongs to some Sobolev space or some function space. It's a complicated function. And I'm going to approximate with the neural networks. What is the best or what is the worst that I can do? And this worst case <coughs> guarantee is what is called, uh, the best approximation is what is called as the uh, approximation error. And this is the one that we were saying can blow up with dimension, okay? So there's a cursor dimensionality here. But remember, because I'm looking at solutions of PDE, solutions of PDE have some regularity and different people, including us, have shown different results here. Let's ask. Yeah, what I'm asking is that mm -hmm. the difference that you know about the architecture with the use of MSC solutions and it's not the issue to you know about the architecture. Uh, there is... Yeah, so I simplified things quite a bit, but uh, it is this property is independent of architecture. Well, that makes sense because in your current neural network, you want to you want to make the neural network much more deeper, right? That's what you think. You know how many layers are there in uh, Chat GPT or GPT four? GPT three is not so deep. It's only eight or nine transformer layers. So depth, the role of depth is a very separate one. So these results are based on, the one that I'm showing you here is based on a very deep network actually. So it's based on a network whose depth grows logarithmically with error. So it's a, it's a very deep network, but there is no guarantee that the, the role of depth and, so this is the sort of, if you think of the development of machine learning in the beginning, people said, okay, everything can be done by shallow networks, right? And then some people said, no, no, we need deep networks and the deeper, the better, and the deeper, the better, and so on. And let's have 20 layer or 30 layer networks, uh, ResNets and whatnot. But these days, um, the most effective networks are those which are based on transformers. They are they're deep, but they are not super deep, you know, compared to what ResNets were. So the role of depth in, uh, in determining how a neural network functions is a completely open question in some sense. But so this, this uh, result that I told you, it is not uh, independent of depth. It depends on depth. So it's, but it's, it has already taken depth into account. So there is a clear characterization. So if you, de it depends also on the activation function, surprisingly, because the, or perhaps not surprisingly, because if you need a ReLU, then uh, it requires, or ReLU type uh, activation functions, then it requires more depth. If you take hyperbolic tangent activation functions, for instance, it does not require more. So this is, uh, there's a little bit more nuance here, but it's, it's a good question, right? You think that just by going deeper and deeper and deeper, you will do better, but that's not always the case. Also, you can, you can try that in your own, uh, in your own projects, for instance, you will see that if I take a layer, uh, which is 20 layers, and then I take only 10 neurons per layer, this is not going to function any better than taking 200 neurons and a single layer, you know, so there is, a, so this is a bit, bit empirical. Now, essentially, the point that I tried to make uh, before the question was the following, that instead of this exponential growth, 
It's essentially polynomial, a small polynomial. Okay, why do I write it? It's essentially linear or quadratic, which is good. Linear or quadratic. So the point is, uh, it's not the exact rate, you know, because in practice, how do you distinguish between exponential and a very high polynomial? It means we are not going to make a distinction between them, but the principle is what is important because uh, the maps that we are trying to learn, and it's the same with images or text and so on. These are not random objects, okay? These have some additional structure. And the additional structure is not just given in terms of regularity, but in the fact that these are solutions of PDEs. Because these are solutions of PDEs, in principle, sm much smaller networks will be able to learn them. Okay, so that's somehow the bottom line. Uh, the mathematical details are not essential. But that is not enough because the error itself has many components. A key component is optimization, means uh, no one understands that, but at least we have some handle on it because we know what our training error is, right? So in practice, we know what is our training error. We know that a relatively small networks can approximate uh, the approximate, uh, neural network. So what we are left with is, at least in this narrow sense, what is called generalization error, which is the fact that when we train, you cannot train on the whole uh, distribution itself. So you, because ideally you would like to have an integral here, right? But uh, in practice, we don't have that. We have a discrete set of data. So this is the error that you do. So the generalization error is finite sample size error. Finite sample size error. You can think of it as some sort of a quadrature error. What do I mean? Remember that this is going to be an integral, right? So this is an integral. I'm approximating it with essentially Monte Carlo. It's not Monte Carlo because things are not independent, but uh, by some mathematical tricks, you can show that this finite sample size error has an asymptotic form, which goes like this. So up to a logarithm, it's essentially like a square root. So all of you know Monte Carlo. So whenever we integrate a function with Monte Carlo, the error, is independent of dimension, which is great because we want things which are independent of dimension. However, it depends on the on the number of samples as a square root, one over square root, right? So you know, to get 1% error, 10 to the power minus two, I need 10,000 samples roughly. But it's independent of dimension. I need 10,000 samples in 1D and I need 10,000 samples in 100 dimensions. So that's the advantage of this, right? So somehow random training makes sense because if you have high dimensional data, and if you take uh, samples, then this is the number that you're going to get. So what is the bottom line from all these formulas? The bottom line is what's important, that because we are solving PDEs, the solutions of PDEs have a lot of structure. We can leverage that structure in order to say that relatively small networks, they will still be large, but relatively small networks can learn. And you need uh, the sample complexity, which scales like a square root, OK? So is that clear? And then this itself has a, there is a caveat to that, right? Because even if you assume that the approximation error and the training error are small, still your total error will behave in the following manner. It's um, like a square root essentially. I'm just writing down the square root in, uh, in, a, in a fancy way. It depends on the, on the neural network that you have and it depends as a square root of the number of samples. But even if I had uh, this thing to be order of one, the numerator to be order of one, you see that an error of 1% would still need 10,000 training samples. 10,000 is where uh, roughly traditional, like, you know, when people had this uh, CIFAR type, ImageNet type uh, machine learning, it was like 10,000 samples. Okay, fine, 10,000 doesn't seem like a lot, but remember my computation in 2D, this took me two minutes. Let's say two minutes. Two minutes is what you need. You can't do it better than two minutes. And then 10,000 is already 20,000 minutes. 20,000 minutes is serious computing time for a small problem here, right? Now, just imagine if I had it in 3D, right? So now imagine in 3D, uh, computing anything in 3D takes me not uh, two minutes anymore. It takes me node hours, 300 node hours. Just imagine doing 10,000 of these. And do that, right? So this is a big difference that sometimes people fail to appreciate between machine learning for images and text and uh, speech and so on, 
because their data is cheap. Means uh, take a camera and you can take a lot of data. Here, on the other hand, that is not always the case, right? Because and this is what I said that there is a contrast with the big data success of machine learning. Because here, sometimes, not always, there will be situations where we have lots of data, but sometimes we are in a data poor situation. Like the example that I showed you, that I want to compute the lift and the drag given the shape of an airfoil. Now, I cannot do 10,000 simulations, since I can just as well do my optimization process. Uh, so you cannot work with the huge amounts of data. So not always, but often you are in what is called a data poor regime. So even if everything works, we still have to be careful about how we are going to use our limited data. Okay. And the reason for that is because data is much more expensive for us to collect than it is for speech and text and so on. Okay. So any questions on that? Is that point clear? So we cannot rely on just having lots of data. Ideally, if we, we can access more data, more the merrier, right? Because the error will go down, right? Uh, if you have 20,000 instead of 10,000, it goes down, but it goes down slowly. And anyway, it will hit the optimization error at some point. So what do we do when we are confronted with this sort of relatively data poor situation? What, what can we do? Means if it's only very little data, we have probably something like pins, but uh, if we have some data, let's say 100 instead of 10,000, what can we do? So there are various things that one do. Uh, usually, in, for instance, last year I covered many of them, but I think today I will just cover only one simple trick. So essentially, these are tricks from numerical analysis. There are other tricks, okay? I just uh, the lack of time makes me focus on one particular one, which is that instead of, so there is some room for maneuver here, right? Because uh, remember that in my training process, I always took a random training set. And this is, this makes sense when you are uh, having images and text and so on. But when you're generating data from simulations or when you're generating data from experiments, perhaps we have some <clears throat> freedom there. And that freedom can be sort of uh, leveraged or used. And one such use is by changing my training set to something which is uh, maybe more suitable for our applications. And these are what are called as low discrepancy sequences. It's just one trick, guys. Okay. Now, what is a low discrepancy sequence? So essentially, if I did not have high dimensions, okay, if I had just two dimensions, for instance. This the example that I have here is two dimensions. I would not take random points to integrate a function, right? I would just take grid points, for instance, or some quadrature points, Gauss Lobato or Gauss Radau or whatever. But uh, now in 10 dimensions or 20 dimensions or 50 dimensions, I cannot do that because uh, I can't store a grid. So what do I do? That's why numerical analysts many times, many years ago, they came up with the idea of low discrepancy sequences. So the idea is, uh, I'm not, I don't have the time to explain all the details, but uh, it's very easy to implement. Just like how do you draw random data? You take your random number generator or pseudo random number generator, and you just call from the distribution that you have, right? Similarly, you can do the same with low discrepancy sequences, just one line in whatever uh, SciPy or whatever package that you're using. So random, so roughly the idea is can be explained in terms of the of this picture here is the following. So random is Monte Carlo. I have labeled it as Monte Carlo. It's in blue. So I have taken a grid and I have divided it into smaller squares. So there are 25 squares in the grid, right? Now, because the random points are what they are, you can see, for instance, in this square, there's no random point. Uh, this square, there's no random point. This square, there's no random point, uh, no random point, and so on. So many of these squares are empty, okay? And this means that random points are not so well distributed because now in order to access my parameter space, I need lots and lots of parameters. And with random points, with a few random points, I have lots of gaps. And especially if you do high dimensions, these gaps are very large. That's why it works because if it starts filling in, then you'll be hit by the person dimensionality. But now, can I design a set of points which are better filling in the squares? And the answer is yes. The best is, of course, to take grid points because I could have just taken the center of each cell and then I would have been okay. Then each of these small squares is a point. But now you can imagine that this is a construction you can't do in high dimensions because you have 10 dimensions 
you can't store a five by five grid in 10 dimensions. So you can't do that. So instead, what one comes up is what are called uh, equidistributed or better spread out sequences. Let me take one of them. It's called a Sobol sequence. Uh, and the idea is the following. Well, I'm not going, just let's look at the picture here. So this is the orange stars. Now you can see in those places where there was no random point, for instance, here, there is orange star or uh, here, for instance, there is orange star and so on, right? So they are much, does, if you start counting, there are many less empty squares than they used to be with random points, okay? So this is this is the roughly the def, there is a clear definition of what equidistributed is, but this is not I don't have the time for that. But intuitively, we just take a better spread out set of points which don't necessarily suffer from the curse of dimensionality, and this can indeed be done. For instance, uh, Sobol is a typical example of such points. So if you take anything MATLAB or Python and you just do SciPy and you just ask to generate Sobol points, then it will give you Sobol points. It's, it's, it's something that you don't have to worry. It's a black box there, right? And these, uh, the reason why numerical analysts looked at these uh, objects is because they are the basis of what is called quasi Monte Carlo integration schemes. So instead of having a function f of y dy, you'll approximate it by summation one over M of F of YI. And this YI are this low discrepancy sequence LDS. So this is the approximation. This is what is called a quasi Monte Carlo approximation. And uh, this is a well-founded technique in numerical analysis. And the idea is that, okay, now since we have this design freedom of this design of these points, Instead of taking random ones, we're going to take this low discrepancy sequences. For us, generating them is the same price as generating random points. So whether you take quasi random or the, so this is, you have to use what is called a quasi random number generator. Random number generator. Not pseudo, but quasi random number generator. And this is uh, something that one can, oh, there are many which exist. Now, what is the advantage of doing that? So remember with random points, the issue was always that you get a square root here. Can we change that? The answer is yes. So as long as the function has some properties, let's say you take uh, Sobol sequences, then the total error is given in terms of the training error. The training error is always what it is, but the generalization error now has this property here. So it's, remember that for random points, random, E was less than ET plus some constant, which depends on your L and your neural network by a square root of N. Okay. Here on the other hand, you don't have a square root of N. You have one over N. Okay. But up to a log. And of course, when D is very, very large, at some point, this log term wins over. But D equal to 50 is completely fine. The log term is not going to be that small. So as long as your target function has some nice properties and that nice property is given by what is called a hardy krause variation. So essentially it is something like this. So you have your domain and you have the D bar, the mixed derivative of L dy1 up to dy d bar. So this quantity is going to be dy is going to be finite. Okay, so it's a strange mixed derivative. But if your function is, uh, in particular, if you have enough smoothness, this is always the case. So as long as your function has enough regularity, then what does it tell us? That by taking, hello, you have a question? No? If you have, you can always ask me. Okay, so then you take these points and you see that uh, one over n, Forget the log for the time being. You can't because in 100 dimensions, this hits you. But there is a huge difference between square root of n and one over n. Why is that? Because earlier, remember that I needed 10 to the power four, but now I can take a square root of that. So it's instead of that, I can have 100 training samples to get 1% error. Okay, so the what is the bottom line here? So given that we are in this low data regime, I have a way in which I can get out of it by leveraging or by using a trick here. There are many such tricks, uh, probably in the lecture notes, you'll have a couple of other tricks that you can use. So instead of taking random points, I can take this, train my uh, neural network on this, 
And then hopefully with less number of coins, the theory suggests that uh, it should still work. Okay, so is that clear why this particular design change or it doesn't change anything. It just changes which points we're evaluating your training from, training points from. And does it work? Let me give you one simple example. I have a, I have a couple of examples to finish the lecture today. And this is the same problem that I had before. So I have been given this Higgs and parameters. So this is in 20 dimensions. So 20 dimensions uh, are sure this log is not so big, okay? And the idea is to predict the drag, the predict the lift and to predict the flow field. So flow field is this picture here. So this is my ground truth. And this is what I obtain after my training process, okay? So now this is a very high resolution simulation, not something that takes two minutes, but it rather takes 40 minutes because it's a very high resolution simulation because I wanted to get this shock to be very, very sharp, okay? It can be less sharp if you take something which is uh, coarser. And the idea is that first of all, I can just use a you know, network with a ReLU activation function, nothing fancy or ReLU type leaky ReLU or some simple activation function. And I only need a relatively small network, something like 10,000 parameters, okay? And I take only 128 training samples not 10,000 samples, because if I had 10,000 samples, then there is, uh, there is no gain. And in this particular experiment, as you can see, the training doesn't take long. Even if I have to predict the whole field, which is this picture, this image here, I, it takes about an hour, but inference is very, very fast. So even, in the, even for this, the inference was like 10 to the power minus. This is on a CPU, not on a GPU, I think. So it's uh, one over 10 seconds, okay? So as you can see, uh, the errors are very small, means one to 2%, you can't do better with machine learning algorithms. Some point the quiz is why not, right? Means also with pins, you saw the sort of errors that you got and they were like 1%, 2% in that ballpark. The question is why can't I get like 0.001? Center. Ask yourself that question. And if you can find an answer, tell me. Uh, no, but there could be some answers. Uh, I'm not joking. Uh, sort of, uh, it's like a test. Why, why do you think we, we can't get higher, higher accuracy? The, the, it has something to do with the training procedure. But uh, okay, so now we have the exact density and the predicted density, even though there was a shock wave, there was no problem in doing the prediction. And in short, it works, right? Because uh, instead of having 40 minute simulation, I can do it in one tenth of a second. And now I can do things fast. For instance, if I want to do optimization, which is what I'll show you in the, probably in the next lecture, I can do things fast. So what is the difference here? The difference is that I use Sobol points. This is exactly the trick that I told you, right? So I use Sobol points. If I have used random points, the error was greater than 10 times. Okay, so this example was, um, I don't know, I, uh, I have some explanations on why this happens, but it's 10, 10 times is a lot, right? Because I 23% error, I can't do anything. So this is, uh, maybe it's okay if you're classifying an image, if I make 23% error, it's okay. But uh, if I want to predict the drag of an airfoil, which is going to be designed, I can't rely on 23% error, okay? So with this number of training samples, by the way, the Monte Carlo error does decrease if you take lots and lots of training samples, but with 100 training samples, you get 10 times more error, which is roughly what you would expect from the theory, right? So there is some sort of correspondence between this. So just by using this one trick, we were able to solve a problem, which is not an easy problem, particularly for the drag. The lift can be done by other surrogates, but for the drag, it's not so easy. And for just uh, giving the lift and the drag, just imagine what is the runtime. It is like uh, uh, microsecond, 10 microseconds, right? So that, that's sort of how fast it is because it just takes the shape, reads in this 20 in, uh, vectors and just infers one. And the networks are very small. And the reason why they're small is because, uh, as I told you, there's a lot more regularity in this case. By going to bigger and bigger networks, it doesn't help you to reduce error any more, any better than 1.5% or something like that. So you are not the depth that you have and the weight that you have, the size of the network is sufficient for this particular problem. Because see, at the end of the day, it's a mapping between uh, essentially a 23 dimensional problem because I have 20 parameter, or 22 dimensional 
two space dimensions and uh, 20 parameter dimensions. And I'm mapping it uh, to, I don't know, four dimensions. So it's a relatively small mapping. Even the 20 dimensions sounds like a lot. From the perspective of a function, it is not. Just imagine if I had a function, I would probably need much more degrees of freedom to represent it. So then, then it, was, uh, it was sort of satisfactory. Once you have success in these kind of prediction tasks, you can use them for downstream tasks. And uh, this is the one downstream task that I will show you today, which is what is called as uncertainty quantification or UQ. So this is uncertainty quantification. By the way, the next tutorial, I think they are going to talk about uh, using this. Uh, once you have trained your neural networks, you can use them in downstream tasks. And uh, uncertainty quantification is one example of that. So what is uncertainty quantification? Uncertainty quantification, simply put, is provide error bars. So provide error bars. So in other words, instead of just computing, given a shape, instead of just computing the uh, drag for a single realization, I want a sort of a distribution of the drag and the lift. So as you can see, these are the lift and the drag distributions, right? And how is it done traditionally? You could use Monte Carlo or quasi Monte Carlo. There are also other methods, but I don't think anything is more competitive with quasi Monte Carlo in this particular case. So what you do essentially is that, okay, forget about this notation here. So the way Monte Carlo works is very, very simple, right? So, so the idea is you vary some parameters. For instance, you vary the, I think the flow parameters here, that is what the uncertainty is taken in account uh, with. And then you just uh, take different realizations of the parameter or of the shape of the parameter, and you keep on computing samples, and then you form what is called an empirical distribution. This is what is called an empirical distribution. And this empirical distribution is essentially a Monte Carlo approximation of your underlying measure. So imagine that you have an underlying measure. Oh, let's see, look for the drag. The drag has a very strange nonlinear. It is not looking, lift, you see, it looks almost like a Gaussian but, or some sort of a Gaussian. The drag is very sort of peaky and uh, difficult, to, um, difficult to calculate at least. So you can't see it because one covers the other, but it has this sort of, uh, okay, I just read. it has this shape, right? Something like this. <clears throat> so how do we, I, I generate this shape? I took different uh, realizations of the shape vector here, computed my solution using my finite volume method, and then computed the empirical measure, which is given by this quantity here. The issue is, of course, that of cost, right? Because now let's say that I've used a thousand Monte Carlo samples, which is what I need, or 10,000 Monte Carlo samples. It's expensive because each of these samples <coughs> is some 40 minutes uh, if you have a high resolution simulation to compute, or two minutes if you use a low resolution simulation. The, the histogram doesn't change much. So what is the uncertainty quantification? So remember that I have already trained my neural network to train it, I needed 100 samples. So <clears throat> I've already trained my neural network to produce the lift and the drag. So all that you do is that you, <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> you train the lift and the drag and uh, then just use them. So remember that instead of just compute the mean, the variance, the histogram, so each of the things in the bin here is no longer from the finite volume solver. It uses the deep neural network, TNN here. Okay, so you take some samples, you train your neural network, and once you have the neural network to get the drag and the lift, it takes uh, 10 microseconds. So within one second, you have generated 10,000 samples and put all these samples to generate these histograms. So the algorithm is very, very, very simple once the training has been done. But remember that I had 100 samples to begin with. So using the 100 samples, I could have computed the mean, the variance, and the histogram. So uh, the, the point is that uh, when I make a measurement, I have to also add the training time, right? Because the training time is a, is a part of the deal. It turns out that irrespective of what you do, if you compare to the traditional algorithms, for instance, with Monte Carlo, you get at least two orders of magnitude speed up, even this. So you take all the samples, train them, and then run your uh, uncertainty quantification algorithm. 
even with quasi Monte Carlo, which was the state of the art, you still have an order of 10 speed up, okay? Which is nothing to laugh at, means uh, uh, order of 10 is quite a lot of money in terms of computing time. So the bottom line is that once you have trained a neural network from the considerations that I just told you, you can use them for different kinds of downstream tasks, not just prediction. Uncertainty quantification is a very difficult downstream task. Why? Because your training samples can also be used as samples to quantify uncertainty. So you have to really outperform the algorithm in order to, you know, to make sense. I don't know if in the project there is, usually there used to be a question on uncertainty quantification. Maybe he didn't do it this year. But uh, so this is one downstream task. There are other downstream tasks and maybe in the next lecture, I'll cover some of them or in the tutorial, we'll cover some of them. Okay, so I think I will just uh, provide a short summary of what we did today. So even though we started out with this operator theoretic or operator learning perspective, we took this uh, hypersimplification, which is to take um, finite uh, or <clears throat> measures which are finite dimensional support, convert everything into parametric PDEs. There's nothing to laugh at because that is what is done in practice often because these parameters have physical interpretations. And then by using different tricks, uh, for instance, low discrepancy sequences in one particular example, here also it is low discrepancy sequences is, uh, is at the bottom of this algorithm. Uh, you could use this as an effective algorithm for downstream tasks because no one is just, you know, well, sometimes you're interested in just prediction, but mostly you are interested in downstream tasks. Uncertainty quantification is an example. Optimization, I'll probably show in the next lecture. Bayesian inversion or inverse problems, these are sort of the downstream tasks. Okay, so with that, I think I finish a bit early. So in the next lecture, we are going to maybe do some downstream tasks and then try to find out what is the caveat, what is the catch here? Means uh, what, why, <clears throat> why do I bother about operator learning if this thing works so well? And there are issues with that. So if you have the bandwidth, try to think why, what is the, what's the defect in this procedure? What, what, can, what can go wrong? And I'll tell you in the next lecture. Okay, so we meet next uh, Friday. Ciao.